Hello, I'm Chris Hewitt. This is Game Shock TV, and at long last we've reached August, which means there's nothing good in the telly. Well, apart from this, of course. And the gaming industry has entered hibernation, like a tired little hedgehog. Still, there's tons to get excited about in this month's show, like this montage, for example, which we've lovingly crafted just for you. The beautiful game gets its latest facelift with new seasons of FIFA and Pro Evo. We pick out the best latest releases, buck the trend of Hollywood dross with some decent movie tie-ins, and explore life at the other end of the spectrum with a delve into indie game development. Ah, hazy summer days. You know, they always evoke those carefree childhood afternoons when, armed with a magnifying glass, I'd rain fiery death upon legions of unsuspecting tiny ants. At night, I can still hear their screams. Anyway, if unlike me you still crave those heady days, you'll be delighted to know that this month brings the release of Earth Defense Force Insect Armageddon with all new ways of exploding giant insects with very big guns, which is obviously a lot cleaner. In the sort of scenario Ed Wood had wet dreams about, Earth has been invaded by giant bugs and it's down to you to face off against the oversized arachnids and their death-dealing mechanical chums. Boasting neither good graphics, a storyline with any kind of depth, nor production values beyond a 1950s Doctor Who episode, the latest EDF should have pants written all over it. But like a slightly mangy, one-eared puppy, there's something about it you can't help but love. It's certainly not the muted, featureless environments, painted from the Dulex range of dusted turd, nor is it the clunky animations or basic controls, and it's not the lack of cinematic set pieces and choreographed quick-time events. Or is it? Truth is, None of those really matter once you pick up the controller and find yourself rooted to the edge of your seat several hours later. Its manic arcade-style action proves guiltily addictive. It spools out endless waves of enemies to shoot at, with just enough respite to be forgiving, but not enough time for you to worry about what you're doing or why. Namco have realized that when you're having fun, finer details don't matter. Sometimes good cakes don't need icing. Simplistic it may be, but what it does, it does with aplomb. For starters, there are plenty of character attributes to tinker with to keep things fresh. Choose from four different soldiers, a vanilla trooper, jet-packed sniper, heavy weapons specialist, and a tactician kitted out with some nifty and incredibly useful turrets and mines. So far, so standard, but the classes are all implemented in an interesting way, feeling balanced and with plenty of room for expansion and customization. With over 300 weapons to choose from and various robotic vehicles to jump into, you're not lacking in shiny murder machines either. Another massive plus is the co-op. Split screen or online, this is a seriously social game with the sheer avalanche of enemies providing the perfect theatre for fist-pumping camaraderie and whiny recrimination. On your own, you're still accompanied by AI teammates to revive when they die and who will do the same for you. Happily, they're only mildly stupid, sometimes wandering directly into explosives you've just planted, but since there's no option to command them, it helps that they're allowed to shoot a lot, provide generic equips, and act as a distraction for the enemies. And to that end, they work a treat. As shooters go, this is a very definition of cheap and cheerful, fully embracing the B-movie nature of the storyline with a correspondingly B-gaming experience. As long as you're willing to embrace this too, there's plenty to enjoy yourself with here, and as a pick-up-and-play bout of mindless violence, this really hits the spot. Don't expect another Call of Duty or Crisis, but if you're looking for something inexpensive to fill your hours with joy, then hunt this down and kiss goodbye to your weekends. Hollywood just loves the summer months, while Captain America, Harry Potter and their best buds are busting blocks at your local multiplex, their gaming counterparts slither along in their wake, desperately fine for your affections. And more often than not, between you and me, they're a bit crap. So after another dismal dribble of subpar efforts this year, we decided to take a look at some of the movie tie-ins from this generation of consoles that are actually worth top billing. It wasn't me this time, I swear it. More a sequel than a direct tie-in, you play a new recruit to the Ghostbusters fold, tasked with aiding the original quartet with some eerie goings-on in Spook Central. All my data indicate that the ghost world is beginning to push through multiple cross portals from their dimension into ours. Well, more overtime. Voiced by the movie actors, the Ghostbusters are all present and correct, and a joy to hang around, even if Bill Murray sometimes does sound like he's phoning it in from another dimension. Which, to be fair, he probably was. Where's his honor, Pecker? We've got news for him and a photo op. 
There are some frustrations with the fiddly controls and some horrible difficulty spikes early on that mean you'll need to be clairvoyant to know where enemies are coming from. Our low probe experiment is working. You're clairvoyant. Once you get past this, however, wielding your proton pack is a blast. And all the characters and music from the movies make a welcome appearance, from Slimer to Walter Peck to good old Mr. Stay Puffed. With a script penned by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, one-liners come thick and fast, but the characters never feel short-changed, and there's even a solid plot. Despite some flaws, if you're a Ghostbusters fan, who else are you going to call? Why do the good ones always play hard to get? A real 8-bit throwback, Scott Pilgrim's pixelation takes the form of a side-scrolling beat-em-up, Alice Streets of Rage. Tasked with destroying the seven evil exes, it takes a fairly standard genre, but leaders it with great attention to detail. The graphics are cutely nostalgic, and Anna Managuchi's cracking tunes similarly hark back to a long gone bleepy bloopy golden age. Power ups are imaginative and numerous, but the gameplay is perhaps a little on the tricky side for one person. You're better off roping a few friends in to join you in the four player co op, at which point it becomes an arcade classic reborn. Stylish, beautiful, and perfectly pitched, Scott Pilgrim is the perfect partner to a smart, stylish movie. By contrast, this is a rare case of the game actually bettering the movie it's drawn from. The two Riddick titles, Escape from Butcher Bay and Assault in Dark Athena, both available in the latter's release, put you in the charmingly polite and humanistic shoes of Finn Diesel's gravel gargling anti-hero. They say hope. Begins in the dark. In this sense, the games are actually a better approximation of Riddick than the drippy and confused movie could ever manage. Given the freedom to butcher and maim away from the trappings of a Hollywood good guy character arc, Riddick is a great gaming protagonist, fleshed out by some superb stealth mechanics, moody sci fi settings, and brilliant brawling. Plots are likewise allowed more room to breathe in an electronic environment, evolving into a tense and atmospheric ride. Similar to Riddick, Wolverine the game also manages to capture some of the visceral animalism that the movies have all but neutered. Not nearly as deep or sharp as Riddick, this is nevertheless an enjoyably brainless way to get under the skin of everyone's favourite hairy misanthrope. A pretty standard slash and jump brawler, the production values are decent and clawing people's faces off is guiltily good fun in an arcade kind of way. With this price suitably to be slashed by now, you could do a lot worse than take out your pent up berserker rage on this one. Bub. Of course, no list like this would be complete without the granddaddy of them all, GoldenEye, one of the few games that truly nail the experience and tone of its parent film. Originally released for the Nintendo 64, its addictive mix of multiplayer and innovative shooting means it occupies a special place in many a nostalgic heart, something which has not gone unnoticed at Activision. Following on from last year's decent update on the Wii, James Bond will be back for more Goldeneye on Xbox and PS3, albeit in the pummeled, craggy guise of Daniel Craig rather than old smoothie Pierce Brosnan. Given there hasn't been a decent take on Bond since From Russia With Love went old school back in the PS2, we're tentatively excited about this one. It doesn't hold anything as groundbreaking as its originator, surely there's room for a Mass Effect style dialogue reel composed entirely of misogynistic quips, but seeing as it started the whole multiplayer craze, it seems only fair to give this another sip of the martini. Whether this will stand up to modern day scrutiny when there are so many similar games around is one thing, but since neither Call of Duty nor Battlefield allow you to play as a three-nippled assassin or a hulking giant plagued by shoddy dental work, Goldeneye could yet reclaim its license to kill. A world away from Hollywood bigwigs lighting their gold-plated cigars with $100 bills or their gold-plated dollar bills with 100 cigars, they're a bit weird like that, the independent world is gathering more and more momentum, with games such as Minecraft proving that ingenuity can come from anywhere. But why even bother making your own game in the first place? Well, we spoke to the producers of the next potential phenomenon, Project Zomboid, and asked for their hints and tips. Either through redundancy, sadly quite often, or just through really wanting to get their own vision out there. You know, people, are, people do go into indie, indie, indie games and... You know, it's, it's, it is a really interesting place, like to look and also to and also to work. The, the indie scene is wide and it's varied, and for every amazing game that just goes sleeping over, like say Super Meat Boy or Minecraft, 
there's you know there's a myriad of, 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 of smaller ones but I think that's part of the reason it's so interesting as well. Project Zomboid is a survival game. You are a, a balding middle-aged man with an injured wife who uh, is in a town called in a place called Knox County in, in America and it's been taken over by zombies and you have to survive as, as, as long as you can. Basically, it's, it's The Sims meets a, a, a George Romero kind of old-style movie. Um, Project Zomboid started with um, these two guys. They were working uh, for various different studios. Didn't find it creative enough, didn't have um, enough sway in, in, in what they were doing. And, or, you know, it just, um, this wasn't great working conditions. And I, I mean, I, I actually get a lot more sway than I would with, with, with any of the big place, any of the big teams and the big studios, really. I mean, we, we, we can have chats and we can have these great ideas late at night and, we, and then the next, you know, 24 hours later they can be in the game and we, they can be ready to be pumped out and, and, and shown to everybody. Making an indie game the way that we are is very difficult um, and it's mainly through the, the goodwill of the community and, and through the people that really want us to succeed. That, that, that we're still going and that we're pumping out such a, well, a, a product that we think is, is good and, and will be better. We've got the demo out there that's showing people what, what, we, what we're capable of doing and what we are doing. And uh, we're basically saying this is what we're going to create and if you just chip in then you will get access to every iteration of the build as it goes and then you will, in, the, in the end of the day you will get the final product as well. Getting the word out there has just been through a lot of people just really getting into the concept with us. I mean, the, the community support we've had has just been absolutely fantastic. You know, there's an awful lot of gamers. I mean, they're not, a lot of gamers, myself included, they're not getting any younger. And um, at, at, at the end of the day, great gameplay does not necessarily require crazy, crazy pixels or crazy lighting, all that stuff. The only limit of uh, in what we terms of what we can do is maybe our own, own morality. Um, but because we are like on, on the internet, I guess you know. I think at the minute that we go too far, our community will let us know. Maybe we can rein it back back in a bit. But I mean, as it is so far, I mean, the the, the one the opening choice is: do you do you smother your wife with a pillow, or do you care for her and try and get her back back to health? We can basically make the game that our fans and our community re really want. So, uh, as soon as we start making the game wrong, then we can I mean, we can change it. That's the, because of the way we're developing. We're, we're we're giving people, we're showing people what we can do, and then uh, and then we're asking people to invest in us and invest in what in our vision for the game, and then we're giving it to them. So it's an entirely different way uh, to, to to make games, really. Well, that's it for part one. Do stay tuned for part two when there'll be more links just like this one, only using different words.